Thank you very much for joining our study. This is a personal understanding uh, of the Baha'i Writings. It is only my view on it. For an official view, turn to the Baha'i Scriptures themselves, please, and visit baha'i.org. Um, I wish to thank the uh, Baha'i World Administration, uh, all those that are serving their communities out there. And please note that there is an audio file, uh, so you can listen to this presentation instead of viewing it. And also, any quotes that are used will be in a PDF in the description. So the topic we're going to be covering today is called The Path of Knowledge and Bridging Beliefs. About one, the journey of knowledge that uh, we are supposed to undertake according to the Baha'i Writings, and how we're supposed to be using this to actually bridge the various different religious, philosophical beliefs in our planet. Our first section here is called The Supreme Gift. Uh, the first quote we have is from Abdu'l-Baha, and it reads, all blessings are divine in origin, but none can be compared with this power of intellectual investigation and research, which is an eternal gift producing fruits of unending delight. Man is ever partaking of these fruits. All other blessings are temporary. This is an everlasting possession. Even sovereignty has its limitations and overthrow. This is a kingship and dominion, which none may usurp or destroy. Briefly, it is an eternal blessing and divine bestowal, the supreme gift of God to man." Abdu'l-Baha here, uh, one of the central figures of the Baha'i Faith, is telling us that the supreme gift to humankind is intellectual investigation and research. But not only is it the supreme gift, it is something that is eternal. It is, a, it is a sovereignty, an aspect of the fullness of humankind that we carry with us into the next world. And he actually says that all other blessings um, have an end, but that this itself is actually an eternal blessing. And he actually adds that it's an eternal delight. And then we're going to see this in the theme as we move forward, that it's actually not merely that this is a blessed gift unto humankind, but it actually is a source of joy when we undertake it. And he compares this sovereignty, the sovereignty of intellectual investigation and research, to kingship. That actually, though that kind of sovereignty, the sovereignty of kingship and dominion, has its end. Which this sovereignty, the sovereignty of utilizing the supreme gift of God to humankind, has no end. The quote continues. Therefore, you should put forward your most earnest efforts towards the acquisition of science and arts. The greater your attainment, the higher your standard in the divine purpose. The man of science is perceiving and endowed with vision, whereas he who is ignorant and neglectful of this development is blind. The investigating mind is attentive, alive. The callous and indifferent mind is deaf. And dead. A scientific man is a true index and representative of humanity, for through processes of inductive reasoning and research, he is informed of all that appertains to humanity, its status, conditions, and happenings. He studies the human body politic, understands social problems, and weaves the web and texture of civilization. Um, this quote from Abdu'l-Baha is actually both inspiring and challenging, <laughs> because he says that we have to put forward earnest efforts towards actually acquiring the science and the arts, and that an individual who, who actually does this is higher in the divine purpose, that we actually come closer to God through our own intellectual investigation and research. That the scientific man is the true index of humanity, meaning it is the actual true representation of what humankind should be. And this is one of the teachings of the Baha'i Faith, of which there are endless quotes on this topic, um, that really just is quite shocking when you begin to think of it. Uh, not only of the, the, the station to which humankind is called, but also when you consider 
what a society would actually be like if they were to see intellectual investigation, the use of inductive reasoning, of research, and the studying of all of the world as actually sacred, as a process of drawing closer and closer to God himself. And we'll see in, in future deepenings, uh, future studies like this, that actually even science itself is seen as a form of prayer, a form of worship of God. Because we ourselves are fulfilling what he created us to be, to utilize this supreme gift of God. Uh, the quote uh, finishes, In fact, science may be likened to a mirror wherein the infinite forms and images of existing things are revealed and reflected. It is the very foundation of all individual and national development. Without this basis of investigation, development is impossible. Therefore, seek with diligent endeavor the knowledge and attainment of all that lies within the power of this wonderful bestowal. Uh, in the end of this quote, Abdu'l-Baha is saying that it is actually the foundation of all individual and national development. Oftentimes the process of investigation and science and exploring reality uh, can, can sometimes be seen as something other people are supposed to do because that's good for the nation or that's good for the economy or that's good for humanity, but we ourselves have other things to do. Now what's so exquisite about uh, many of the talks on this and many of the quotes we can actually find is that it is actually related not just to the nation or the body politic, but to the individual. That this is actually a process of progress for a person themselves. That they themselves have to engage within the, the study of the world around them as a means for them to progress as a human being. That is intrinsic to the duty of humankind and our human nature that this be carried out. Our next session is called the Path of Knowledge. Uh, the picture I've used is actually a very steep path because while this is a beautiful journey, <laughs> it is at the same time often difficult to actually fulfill this in our lives. So we're going to look at some quotes here from the central figures of the Baha'i Faith. The first one is actually from Abdu'l-Baha, and it reads, I most urgently request the friends of God to make every effort, as much as lieth within their competence, along these lines. The harder they strive to widen the scope of their knowledge, the better and more gratifying will be the result. Let the loved ones of God, whether young or old, whether male or female, each according to his capabilities, bestir themselves and spare no efforts to acquire the various current branches of knowledge, both spiritual and secular, and of the arts. So this quote from Abdu'l-Baha, is telling us that we have to make every effort to expand the scope of our knowledge. And it's not only that it will be better for us, as we've seen before, and for the nation as a whole, but the more gratifying it will actually be. And that these sciences, as should have been clear from the previous quotes, um, aren't merely religious sciences, the study of scripture or the study of morality and the development of a human being along a moral plane or within value, but actually of the actual physical sciences themselves. That this is something that is a duty, each according to their competence, right, to expand their knowledge of the world. Um, this next quote we'll find is actually from Baha'u'llah. Knowledge is as wings to a man's life and a ladder for his ascent. Its acquisition is incumbent upon everyone. The knowledges of such sciences, however, should be acquired as can profit the peoples of the earth, and not those which begin with words and end with words. Great indeed is the claim of scientists and craftsmen on the peoples of the world. In truth, knowledge is a veritable treasure for men, and a source of glory, of bounty, of joy, of exaltation, of cheer and gladness unto him. Thus hath the tongue of grandeur spoken in this most great prison. Here Baha'u'llah, the prophet founder of the Baha'i faith, 
tells us that knowledge itself is a ladder, a ladder of ascent towards God, <laughs> that this is a fundamental aspect of human nature to use our understanding of the world to draw closer to divinity. And he tells us that great indeed is the claim of the scientists and craftsmen, that not only should we choose this as a, as a goal and as a purpose of our own existence, but when we see others in society striving to develop the arts and crafts and sciences, they should be applauded. And that not only as well, once again, is this a story of glory and bounty to the individual, but it's actually a source of joy, uh, of cheer and exaltation. And I think it's, it's really true that when we, when we explore the paths of knowledge and journey along that process, we really can find sweetness and delight in, uh, as Abdu'l-Baha in another place says, the solving of difficult problems, the uncovering of the mysteries of reality, and the study of the body politic. This quote is from Abdu'l-Baha. O ye young Baha'i children, ye seekers after true understanding and knowledge, a human being is distinguished from an animal in a number of ways. First of all, he is made in the image of God, in the likeness of the supernal light, even as the Torah saith, let us make man in our own image, after our likeness. This divine image betokeneth all the qualities of perfection, whose lights, emanating from the Son of Truth, illumine the realities of men. And among the greatest of these attributes of perfection and wisdom, sorry, of these attributes of perfection are wisdom and knowledge. He must therefore put forth a mighty effort, striving by night and day and resting not for a moment to acquire an abundant share of all the sciences and arts. That the divine image which shineth out from the Son of Truth may illumine the mirror of the hearts of men. It is the longing desire of Abdu'l-Baha to see each one of you accounted as the foremost professor in the academies and in the school of inner significances, each one becoming a leader in wisdom. Here Abdu'l-Baha is telling us that we are distinguished from the animal kingdom, not by our physical nature, but by our ability to reflect the attributes and perfections of God. And then he says that the, among the greatest of these is knowledge, our ability to understand the world around us. And because of this, because this is actually part of the divine image, we actually should not rest for a moment in actually uncovering these realities and exploring as much as we can both the outer world and as well the inner world, the world of inner significances. So both our character, our moral, like basically our moral character, but also the world all about us. And that this is actually how we can become a more perfectly polished mirror reflecting the attributes and perfections of the Son of Truth. And this, once again, like to really consider what this actually means for society, what this means for a civilization that is to see science and exploration, both of ourselves and the outer world, uh, not merely as something pragmatic, not merely as something that is useful, but actually that science and investigation is sacred, an actual sacred act, wherein we can actually become more whole as individuals and therefore as a society. The next quote again is from Abdu'l-Baha. Um, during his talks in the early 20th century. God's greatest gift to man is that of intellect or understanding. The understanding is the power by which man acquires his knowledge of the several kingdoms of creation, of various stages of existence, as well as much of which is invisible. Possessing this gift, he is in himself the sum of earlier creations. He is able to get in touch with those kingdoms, and by this gift he can frequently, through his scientific knowledge, reach out with prophetic vision. Intellect is, in truth, the most precious gift bestowed upon man by the divine bounty, 
man alone among created beings, has this wonderful power. Here Abdu'l-Baha tells us again that what is the real, true distinguishing feature of humankind is our intellect or our understanding. And here he uses a word that is not just our, the most supreme gift, but is the most precious. That is something to be shielded and cared for, to be protected. And in that we see that this is actually what enables us to unravel all the mysteries of creation. So how precious a gift this actually is. And this is something that needs to be really understood, especially in the prevalent discourses of society. As we live in a world where the fruits of the intellect of an investigation are often under fire. That it is, it is absolutely necessary that humankind not study things, but actually recognize that it is within the very fundamental purpose of humankind to actually reach out with our heart, with our minds as well as our hearts, to actually begin to understand all of nature and to see intellectual investigation, research, the use of inductive reasoning, the sciences and the arts and the fruits that we create from them as a sacred, a fundamentally sacred aspect of the very the very purpose of creation. It's important to point out how refreshing a principle this actually is. The Baha'i Faith makes the exploration of the natural world a sacred act. And this is shockingly refreshing to see that within the holy scriptures of a world embracing religion, we find that the intellect itself, that the process of rational investigation and the production of the arts and the fruits of those investigations, to actually be something not tolerated or looked at askance or, or questioned, but actually fully celebrated as a form of sacred worship and a fulfillment of what we are as human beings. This principle of the Baha'i Faith its overarching investigation of the beauty and the preciousness and the exquisite bounty and joy of intellectual investigation needs to be taken account of in the prevalent discourses surrounding religious discussions about faith and reason, and also the relationship between science and religion, a topic we will explore in much more depth in the future. Um, we now turn to uh, what is often called the very first principle of the Baha'i Faith, uh, the independent search for truth. And our first quote actually uh, really bears considering. This is from Abdu Baha, and it reads Our Father will not hold us responsible for the rejection of dogmas which we are unable either to believe or comprehend. For he is ever infinitely just to his children. This is a quote I encountered very early on in my investigation of the Baha'i Faith. And once again, coming from a religion, I found it astounding. <laughs> Why? Because we're being told that we're not held responsible for rejecting something that makes no sense. And we're not being held responsible for doing so because God is just. And I was a student of comparative religions. Uh, before I became a Baha'i. And I always found the way religions were presented to me um, somewhat frustrating, because I would be told that I, I just have to have faith, but not just faith in, uh, say, the prophet founder of that religion, be it Muhammad or Buddha or Christ, uh, but also actually within the particular doctrines within, that I actually just had to accept this. And this seemed unjust to me, because why would God <laughs> be actually uh, holding me responsible when I'm trying my best to actually use my intellect to understand what is supposed to be his revelation unto humankind. As I began to study uh, the religious scriptures <laughs> of the various world religions, as opposed to actually listening to what people told me, um, I came to realize that this is actually a principle found in all the world's religions. 
Now, that might sound shocking <laughs> to some people, but actually we can find the principle of investigation and the necessity of producing strong reasons for one's faith, for example, the New Testament, um, and really actually proving all things as part of Hinduism, Buddhism, Christianity, Islam. We might find it, uh, for viewers who are Baha'is, as extremely present within the Baha'i writings. But actually these principles can be found in all previous faiths, that this really is the eternal faith of God. That we are being told that, once again, this is the purpose of our existence to actually explore the powers, these supreme gifts being given to us by God. This next quote is from Abdul Baha, his talks in the United States and Canada, called The Promulgation of Universal Peace. It reads, One whose father was a Jew invariably proved to be a Jew. A Muslim was born of a Muslim. A Buddhist was a Buddhist because of the faith of his father before him, and so on. In brief, religion was a heritage Sending from father to son, ancestry to posterity, without investigation of the fundamental reality. Consequently, all religionists were veiled, obscured, and at variance. This is a very common critique of um, religious institutions and religious communities, and it's important to notice it. Um, Religion should never be something that is just tied to one's culture. I would suggest that this is actually at variance with the very scriptures and the history of each of these faiths. If any Jew remained, if you're a Christian, if any Jew remained a Jew because that was his heritage, then he never could have become Christian. But even within the Jewish faith, if they had held to their heritage, what we hear of the story of Noah, then they could never have accepted Abraham. Or Moses. Um, we cannot choose our faith based on what we've known or in, in uh, like a covenant unto our parents. Our, our covenant is with God to use these faculties that he's given us so that we can find the truth and that we're told here in this quote that this uh, obscuring and veiling came upon humanity because instead of looking at one's faith, be it Buddhist, Buddhism or Islam or Judaism or Christianity, as something that needs to be understood and explored and investigated, we fell into this position where that's just what we do. And then naturally then, we're not willing to look across the border to look at another faith and open our hearts to the understanding of that other community, or even considering there then the possibility that it actually might be another revelation of God another tree planted by the divine gardener in another land. Mahaula tells us, How far from the grace of the all-bountiful and from his loving providence and tender mercies it is to single out a soul from amongst all men for the guidance of his creatures and on one hand to withhold from him the full measure of his divine testimony and on the other, inflict severe retribution on his people from having turned away from his chosen one. In all the scriptures of the world, we're told that we're held to account for our process of investigation. We cannot say, well, I'm going to be a Christian because my parents were a Christian, or I'm going to be a Jew because my family is Jewish. Um, we're told that we actually are responsible. We actually have a duty to investigate. And Baha'u'llah here is telling us that it would be completely unjust for God to hold us responsible for recognizing his messengers, this singling out of a soul from amongst all people for the guidance, and on the other hand, to actually judge humankind for not actually accepting. This would be unjust. So we know that God must have given us the ability to use our rational faculty, our power of investigation and research to find out whether his revelation is true. And this is a fundamental principle of the Baha'i faith, this independent search for truth. Baha'u'llah again says, 
he hath endowed every soul with a capacity to recognize the signs of God. How could he otherwise have fulfilled his testimony unto men? If ye be of them that ponder his cause in their hearts, he will never deal unjustly with anyone. Neither will he task a soul beyond its power. He verily is the compassionate, the all-merciful. Once again, it's not... Oh. We see here that every person has been given the ability. Everyone has the capacity to recognize the signs of God in his message. Or else, once again, this would be unjust. How could God give unto humankind the duty to recognize his message, and at the same time not give him the capacity to recognize it within their lifetime? And this puts the onus again on our independent investigation, on our rational faculties, and for myself, on my ability to share in, in as pure a form as I can the actual revelation of God. My duty to do the best I can to use my rational faculty to help others see the pristine beauty and wonder within the revelation of God. This is from Abdu'l-Baha. Man must cut himself free from all prejudice and from the result of his own imagination so that he may be able to search for truth unhindered. Truth is one in all religions, and by means of it the unity of the world can be realized. All the peoples have a fundamental belief in common. Being one, truth cannot be divided. And the differences that appear to exist among the nations only result from their attachment to prejudice. If only men would search out truth, they would find themselves united. There's a beautiful part of this quote from Abdu'l-Baha, because he actually says all peoples have a fundamental belief in common. Meaning, whether you're a Buddhist, a Hindu, a secularist, an atheist, we can all agree on this. There is a truth. And actually, it cannot be self-contradictory. So that we must use our rational faculty in order to investigate any claim put for us, put before us, to see whether it is true. Now we see that truth cannot be divided, and at the same time, the Baha'i faith presents the unity of religion, a belief in the fundamental oneness of religion. And that might seem strange to some people and some viewers, but this is the, this is actually the question of the Baha'is: Will we put aside our prejudice? Well, we put aside what we think we know and actually investigate to see if they are one? Or do we decide prior to investigation that this cannot be true? If five people meet together to seek for truth, they must begin by cutting themselves free from all their own special conditions and renouncing all preconceived ideas. In order to find truth, we must give up our prejudices, our own small, trivial notions. An open, receptive mind is essential. If our chalice is full of self, there is no room in it for the water of life. The fact that we imagine ourselves to be right and everybody else wrong is the greatest of all obstacles in the path towards unity. And unity is necessary if we would reach truth, for truth is one. Therefore, it is imperative that we should renounce our own particular prejudices and superstitions if we earnestly desire to seek the truth. Unless we make a distinction in our minds between dogma, superstition, and prejudice on the one hand, and truth on the other, we cannot succeed. When we are in earnest in our search for anything, we look for it everywhere. This principle we must carry out in our search for truth. There's no doubt that this principle is very difficult to implement. <laughs> uh, it is an ideal that we have to, as individuals and as a society, strive to implement. To, because in the previous quote, in this quote as well, we see that uh, truth is one. And if we believe truth to be one and not to contradict itself, we see that we can find unity in our process of going towards that truth that we have to renounce our prejudices, and in order to do this we have to assume that it's actually possible that either we're wrong, or we actually might have an aspect of that truth. 
at least assume the possibility of that, so we can begin this investigation together. And given we live in a world just completely divided by ideology, that which truly divides humankind, whether it be political, religious, or philosophical, we actually have to come to a place where we can agree that truth is one, and that we actually have to search it. And this final statement here, that when we are earnest in our search, for anything, we look for it everywhere. And there has to be in us a burning desire to actually understand, to use that supreme gift for what it was made for. Shall man, gifted with the power of reason, unthinkingly follow and adhere to dogma, creeds, and hereditary beliefs, which will not bear the analysis of reason in this century of effulgent reality? Unquestionably, this will not satisfy men of science, for when they find premise or conclusion contrary to present standards of proof and without real foundation, they reject that which has been formerly accepted as standard and correct, and move forward from new foundations. Once again, we see Abdu'l Baha talking about this supreme precious gift of God to humankind. And that it would be a violation of that very gift for us to actually accept dogmas and creeds and hereditary beliefs that do not stand up to the analysis of reason. Now, that doesn't mean that hereditary beliefs, dogmas, or creeds are wrong. They may be so, but we actually have to investigate them and investigate them anew and see if they're founded and established within the original scripture of these faiths. And that if we find that they are not, we must reject them and accept new standards and new principles. And we see once again that in the Baha'i writings, we're told that this process of investigation, of rational inquiry, of the use of deductive and inductive reasonings, is really part and parcel of what we are. We're not distinguished from other beings by our physicality. It's actually this capacity of us that distinguishes us from other kingdoms. So in a sense, for us to actually put aside our rational faculty, for us to deny that we have this capacity, or to leave it idle and neglect it, would be almost as if to take a part of our body off, to cut off a limb of our very physical temple, even more so, because this is what makes us what we truly are. This I titled The Fragrant Sword, Arguments in the Spark of Truth. The reason why is because in the Baha'i writings we're supposed to be eloquent and loving and compassionate, and we should never mistreat anyone. It is unbecoming our very nature to treat each other um, inappropriately, to be rude and get angry. So argument in this context doesn't mean an argument as the one full of anger, but rather argumentation, the producing of reasons and rationale, rational reasons for why we believe what we believe. Uh, this first quote, we'll see, is a very, uh, very cardinal quote from the Baha'i writings. The shining spark of truth cometh forth only after the clash of differing opinions. I absolutely love this quote. <laughs> Because it's telling us that it is when two ideas or two worldviews, two perspectives or more, clash into each other, that actually the truth sparks out from that. So rather than debate being something that is supposed to be seen as inappropriate or unbecoming us, it's actually vital. In fact, if you notice in the quote, it says only that it's actually only after the clash of differing opinions. So that we as Baha'is and as a world as a whole have to become very, very, very comfortable debating. Because we cannot find truth except for the process of clashing different opinions together. It would be wonderful if in the future we had time to look into what Baha'is call the principle of consultation the means whereby we can actually find truth through debate and dialogue. 
For now, let's look at some more quotes on argumentation. So here we have another quote from Abdu'l-Baha. It is at such times that the friends of God avail themselves of the occasion, seize the opportunity, rush forth and win the prize. If their task is to be confined to good conduct and advice, nothing will be accomplished. They must speak out, expound the proofs, set forth clear arguments, draw irrefutable conclusions, establishing the truth of the manifestation of the Son of Reality. This is one of the clearest quotes I know of within the Baha'i writings regarding argumentation. And it's important to understand the difference between an argument and arguing. <laughs> it might be better called to debate or an put forth arguments and fighting. Um, in our culture, we generally, when we hear the word argument, we usually think of people being angry or upset using raised voices. This is not actually what argumentation or an argument means. It means putting forth the reasons for what you believe. And we have to actually separate these to understand what the Baha'i writings are actually talking about. We can actually be putting forward proofs and arguments for something, either in a contentious way, creating conflict and dissension among people, or we can do that very same thing in a harmonious, loving, and compassionate way. It's as if we really have to be, even if we started out peaceful in our discussion, that we're actually really watching our own emotions, our own feelings, lest conflict, dissension, or prejudice arise. And it is our duty to actually be able to produce, to expound the proof, set forth clear arguments. Because as this quote says, if we confine our task to advice and good conduct, sorry, good conduct, it says nothing will be accomplished. It necessitates this clashing of different opinions so that the spark of truth can come forward. So in a sense, we actually have to become very comfortable with people disagreeing <laughs> with each other so that we can find the truth and to understand clearly why it is what we believe so that we can share those with others. And the thing is we have to come into this process without a belief that we know everything and the other one does not. As we've seen before that our chalice is not full of self, that we are not allowing our attachments or our love of one view, or our prejudice or hatred of another view, or individual, or people, to actually turn us away from that truth. It is a very challenging objective, but it's a goal that is ultimately worthwhile. So this next quote is from Shoghi Effendi, uh, whose title is The Guardian of the Faith, um, one of the central interpretive figures of the Baha'i Faith. And he says, Without the assistance of God as given through the message of Baha'u'llah, peace can never be safely and adequately established. To disregard the Baha'i solution for world peace is to build on foundations of sand. To accept and apply it is to make peace not a mere dream or an ideal, but a living reality. This is the point which the Guardian wishes you to develop, to emphasize again and again and to support by convincing arguments. This is a very challenging quote <laughs> by the Guardian, because he's stating very clearly what the Baha'i Faith is proclaiming to the world, that without the message of Baha'u'llah, we cannot come together as a people, that it is through the instrument of Baha'u'llah's teachings and his administrative order that we can bring the human family together. Yet this as well makes this not a dream or some vision, but an actual reality. We have to accept it and apply it. But in order to do this, we have to emphasize this again and again and support it by convincing arguments. Again, that it is not merely to give our counsel, to give our advice that this is what we should do, but to give reasons, reasoned arguments as to why it is that 
to disregard the Baha'i solution for world peace is to build on foundations of sand. We actually have to be able to show why that is. And all the Baha'i writings bring this home to, to the Baha'i community. And once again, to distinguish between arguing and fighting. So this next quote is from the Gleanings of the Writings of Baha'u'llah. Warn, O Solomon, the beloved of the one true God, not to view with too critical an eye the sayings and writings of men. Let them rather approach such sayings and writings in a spirit of open-mindedness and loving sympathy. He then continues, It is incumbent upon all men, each according to his ability, to refute the arguments of those who have attacked the faith of God. He that wisheth to promote the cause, it continues, of the one true God, let him promote it through his pen and tongue, rather than have recourse to sword or violence. If any man were to arise to defend in his writings the cause of God against its assailants, such a man, however inconsiderable his share, shall be so honored in the world to come that the concourse on high would envy his glory. So when we're approaching the writings of individuals, we're to do it in a spirit of open-mindedness. At the same time, it is incumbent, meaning it is a duty of all individuals to refute the attacks. We often think that or I often hear in discussion that those who actually produce misrepresentations of the Baha'i faith, just to leave them alone. And yet Baha'u'llah here is telling us, as was Shoghi Effendi, as was Abdul Baha, that we actually have to give an answer back to them. And that it is not just that we should do so, each according to his capacity, as it says, but that someone who were to arise with their tongue and their pen and defend the cause of God against misrepresentations um, of the Baha'i Faith, that the actual concourse on high, the angelic hosts, would envy his glory. Um, this next quote is from The Secret of Divine Civilization, uh, a work that is very dear to my heart and was very seminal in my own process of becoming a Baha'i. Uh, the quote reads, Public opinion must be directed toward whatever is worthy in this day. And this is impossible, except through the use of adequate arguments and the adducing of clear, comprehensive, and conclusive proofs. So in this quote, Abdu Ba is telling us that we must put clear, comprehensive, and conclusive proofs. That without these, it's actually impossible to direct public opinion. That rather, again, than just kind of giving our thoughts on a matter, uh, just as in uh, frank and unfettered consultation within the Baha'i community, each individual must have the time and has the duty to actually present the reasons why he believes what he believes, this is the same in our relationship to the whole body politic. Because if we do not, it is impossible for us to actually help educate humankind. Another aspect of this process within the Baha'i writings is that once we have put forward these arguments, once we, in a frank and unfettered way, have adduced proofs that are clear, comprehensive, and, con and conclusive, that we then have to be detached from the process, not hold to our own beliefs, but be actually open to what comes out of that, in, that investigation through the clash of differing opinions. To do battle as stated in the sacred verse, doth not in this greatest of all dispensations mean to go forth a sword and spear, with lance and piercing arrow, but rather weapon with pure intent, with righteous motives, with counsels helpful and effective, with godly attributes, with deeds pleasing to the Almighty, with the qualities of heaven. It signifieth education for all mankind, guidance for all men, the spreading far and wide of the sweet savors of the Spirit, the promulgation of God's proofs, the setting forth of arguments conclusive and divine, the doing of charitable deeds. This quote of Abdu Baha puts forward so many of the facets that we must, as people, uh, bring forward. 
the uh, good deeds, the qualities of heaven, pure intentions, but also within the topic, the setting forth of arguments conclusive and divine. That we must, with all of the most shining qualities we possibly can as a human being, muster those and then share our reasons for what we believe with humanity. It's from the Tablets of the Divine Plan by Abdul Baha. Amongst other things is the holding of meetings for teaching, so that blessed souls and the old ones from amongst the believers may gather together the youths of the love of God in schools of instruction and teach them all the divine proofs and irrefragable arguments. Explain and elucidate the history of the cause and interpret also the prophecies and proofs which are recorded in our extant in the divine books and epistles regarding the manifestation of the Promised One, so that the young ones may go in perfect knowledge in all these degrees. Abdu'l-Bahá here is telling us that it is actually a duty of the older Baha'is to actually gather the youth and actually teach them proofs and arguments. That that is part of what we as a community must do. And that it is through this process of teaching proofs and arguments, of looking at prophecies and interpretations and the history of the cause, that they may go in perfect knowledge. And this is a part and parcel of what it means to be a Baha'i community. That we actually continue the evolution of that supreme gift of God. In this day, there is nothing more important and the instruction and study of clear proofs and convincing heavenly arguments, for therein lie the source of life and the path of salvation. Another quote. Verily, Abdu Baha inhaleth the fragrance of the love of God from every meeting place where the word of God is uttered and proofs and arguments set forth that shed their rays across the world. These two quotes are uh, shockingly clear and powerful <laughs> because we're told how vital it is that we are studying and putting forward proofs and convincing arguments. And it's fascinating because he says, therein lieth the source of life and the path of salvation. And that he inhales, Abdu'l-Bah inhales the fragrance of the love of God whenever the Word of God is uttered and proofs and arguments are being set forth. That this is something that stirs the soul of humankind and increases the beauty of our world. Heroes are they, O my Lord. Lead them to the field of battle. Guides are they. Make them to speak out with arguments and proofs. Ministering servants are they. Cause them to pass round the cup that brimmeth with the wine of certitude. O oh my God, make them to be songsters that carol in fair gardens. Make them lions that couch in the thickets, whales that plunge in the vasty deep. And the second, it is my hope that from day to day your gatherings will grow and flourish and that those who are seeking after truth will hearken therein to reasoned arguments and conclusive proofs. I am with you, heart and soul, at every meeting. Be sure of this. Abdu'l Baha is calling for heroes to enter a field of battle, to speak out with arguments and proofs, and that this is the process of becoming to a place where we brim with the wine of certitude. That he hopes that meetings will grow and flourish and that people will hear reasoned arguments and clear proofs. Once again, the Baha'i writings are so clear on, on, on this principle that it is through this clash of differing opinions that the spark of truth can come forward, that we must use a kindly tongue to attract the hearts of men, and that we should use clear arguments, reasoned arguments, 
comprehensive arguments, conclusive proofs, both to share with people in the outside world, giving them reasons for what we believe, but also to nurture and cultivate the community, to give them the wine of certitude through gatherings where the fragrance of the love of God can be smelled, by producing these for each other so that we can grow as a community in our bid to actually bring unity and peace to the world. So this section is about study in the Baha'i Writings. We've looked at the path of knowledge, the supreme gift of God to mankind, and the independent search for truth. So our first quote here um, is from Abdu'l-Baha. There are certain pillars which have been established as the unshakable supports of the faith of God. The mightiest of these is learning and the use of the mind, the expansion of consciousness, an insight into the realities of the universe, and the hidden mysteries of Almighty God. So we see actually that study is one of these unshakable supports. And the two things that are being brought out are the investigation into the realities of the universe, and the hidden mysteries of Almighty God. This is like our, a former quote we were looking at, which talks about a study of both secular and spiritual. And it's stating that the mightiest of these is learning. So the following quote is from Shoghi Effendi. To deepen in the cause means to read the writings of Baha'u'llah and the Master so thoroughly as to be able to give it to others in its pure form. There are many who have some superficial idea of what the cause stands for. They therefore present it together with all sorts of ideas that are their own. As the cause is still in its early days, we must be most careful, lest we fall under this error and injure the movement we so much adore. There is no limit to the study of the cause. The more we read the writings, the more truths we can find in them. The more we will see that our previous notions were erroneous. This quote is so important. We're told actually in another place by Abdu'l-Baha that we should be striving uh, to give the teachings of Baha'u'llah, the Bab, uh, as in as purest form as we can. This is why we're supposed to memorize scripture. And the guardian here, Shoghi Effendi, is actually telling us that it's natural that people end up putting their own thoughts into what the teachings are, and that many of those uh, ideas are their own. So in some sense, when we're not studying the faith, we're not teaching the faith, we're teaching our understanding, and many of those perspectives can come in and sort of cloud the issue. So we're being told here that we should strive as much as we can to study the cause itself, so that we can deliver it in its pure form, because it is the healing remedy for humankind. Another beautiful part of this is that the Guardian says, the more we read the writings, the more we'll see that our previous notions were erroneous. Which tells us, as he says, there's no limit to the study of the cause. So we should endeavor to be constantly interacting with the Word of God, so that we can actually, if you will, cleanse our perspective. And that, therefore, if the Word of God is meant for humankind, it is their purest message which best resonates with humankind. This idea is very difficult to implement. Is one thing we can say, because the Baha'i writings are so vast, for one, uh, and especially when we include all the central figures, it's more the principle or the ideal that we're actually seeking. We're trying to do our best to actually ensure that, be, that we're constantly interacting with, with uh, the writings of the faith, so that this erroneous aspect of our own perspective is constantly being filtered out and our understanding of actually of Baha'u'llah's revelation itself is being nurtured and grown and developed. Naturally, we're always going to fall into the problem of having our own perspective or of our own take on it, and our own personal interpretation is fine, as long as it's not imposed on others. Uh, but really, it's the ideal that we're trying to look at to make sure that this is a fundamental practice of our spiritual life. Uh, this is another quote from Shoghi Effendi, the guardian of the Baha'i Faith. I urge them to study profoundly the revealed utterances of Baha'u'llah and the discourses of Abdu'l-Baha, and not to rely unduly on the representation and interpretation of the teachings given by Baha'i speakers and teachers. 
May the Almighty sustain you and guide you in your work. Uh, obviously, in this context, this is a very, very important quote, because I am presenting my own personal understanding, as I stated at the beginning. Um, my understanding, even of these quotes, is not an official perspective of the Baha'i Faith. And we cannot rely on representation by teachers or speakers. Uh, once again, it's this independent investigation of truth that we've already looked at. If we wish to um, exercise this supreme gift of God, which is human intellect, and f get the fruits of this path of knowledge that we've been looking at, we have to implement the independent investigation, independent investigation of truth. In doing that, we can only achieve an independent investigation of truth if we're constantly reading the writings. And this is a fundamental part of our path. So this is another quote uh, by Shoghi Effendi, the Guardian of the Faith. Shoghi Effendi has for years reached the Baha'is who asked his advice, and in general also, to study history, economics, sociology, etc. in order to be au courant with all the progressive movements and thoughts being put forth today, and so that they could correlate these to the Baha'i teachings. What he wants the Baha'is to do is to study more, not to study less. The more general knowledge, scientific and otherwise, they possess, the better. Likewise, he is constantly urging them to really study the Baha'i writings or the Baha'i teachings more deeply. One might liken Baha'u'llah's teachings to a sphere. There are points, poles apart, and in between the thoughts and doctrines that unite them. So what is Shoghi Effendi really being asking the Baha'is? He was asking the Baha'is to study more, not less, and also to be widening the breadth of our knowledge. This is what we looked at before, where Abdu Baha and Baha'u'llah spoke of it actually being this delectable fruit, that we can find joy and cheer in actually understanding the writings, and the world in general, more deeply. And he's telling us here that scientific or otherwise, we should be studying these different ideas and trying to correlate with them with the Baha'i writings. But what we were just looking at is we can't really do that <laughs> unless we're actually truly, truly understanding what the Baha'i writings say, and increasing our understanding of that. And then at the end here, he's telling us that the, the, the Baha'i, the Baha'u'llah's teachings are like a, a sphere, right, with poles apart, and that there's these thoughts and doctrines that unite them, so that Oftentimes we might see two things that seem to be in opposition, but if we actually follow through the reasoning, we'll actually be able to join them. Once again, we can only do that if we're constantly interacting with the Baha'i writings themselves. Uh, we have here a quote from Abdu Baha from the work The Secret of Divine Civilization. Again, there are those famed and accomplished men of learning, possessed of praiseworthy qualities and vast erudition who lay hold on the strong handle of the fear of God, and keep to the ways of salvation. In the mirror of their minds, the forms of transcendent realities are rejected, and the lamp of their inner vision derives its light from the sun of universal knowledge. They are busy by night and by day with meticulous research into such sciences as are profitable to mankind and they devote themselves to the training of students of capacity. It is certain that to that their discerning taste, the preferred treasures of kings would not compare with a single drop of the waters of knowledge, and mountains of gold and silver could not outweigh the successful solution of a difficult problem. To them the delights that lie outside their work are only toys for children and the cumbersome load of unnecessary possessions is only good for the ignorant and base. Content like the birds, they give thanks for a handful of seeds, and the song of their wisdom dazzles the minds of the world's most wise." Yeah. Um. This is a profoundly heavy quote. <laughs> Uh, Abdu Baha speaking of what the true ideal of a learned man is, or a learned person. We're being told here that we should be busy day and night with meticulous research, exploring the world. Again, science is both secular and holy. And that there's a place where, before we've looked at quotes, for example, that talk about the cheer and joy and gladness 
of uncovering mysteries and understanding the mysteries of the natural world and of Scripture. And here we're being told that there is a, a place that we can achieve where actually the sweetness of actually solving these problems, the sweetness of actually understanding these issues, is actually better than the gold of kings. And that we should be trying to detach ourselves from the world and to seek understanding with the application of this supreme gift of God. As another quote written on behalf of the Guardian. He was very pleased to hear you do a lot of lecturing for the cause. This is a very important field of service and one you should devote as much time to as possible. The public must hear of the faith and new ways and means must be devised to bring it to their attention. He also urges you to study the teaching themselves more deeply. Baha'i scholarship is needed really more than worldly scholarship, for one is spiritual and the other more or less transient. There is a real lack in the cause of people who know the teachings thoroughly, especially their deeper truths, and who can consequently teach the souls properly and lay a permanent foundation, one that tests and trials will not shake down. This quote really speaks to me personally, because I see this deep ocean of beautiful things within the Baha'i writings. There are so many profound social teachings, philosophical concepts, and ways to unite all the religions of this planet. And yet that itself can only be achieved through deeply understanding the Baha'i writings. Of that, finding out that we were previously erroneous in our views, and seeing new bridges to build between these beliefs, new ways to bring people together to build a harmonious world. But also that this quote talks about the ability to teach souls properly and to lay a permanent foundation, one that tests and trials will not shake. That this knowledge, this path of knowledge we've been looking at, the independent investigation of truth, the supreme gift of, of humankind, to humankind from God, being this rational faculty, when it's actually fed properly, it is part and parcel of actually becoming someone with certitude. A permanent foundation. Uh, the next quote is from the Guardian once more. He can see quite clearly both your point of view and that expressed by those dear and devoted Baha'is whom you quoted in your letter. Both are men of much experience and considerable learning in their way. What they no doubt meant was that the solution given to the world's problems by Baha'u'llah is the only solution being divine in origin, and most desperately needed. Therefore we, the few who have caught the vision, should not waste our energies beating up and down the paths pursued by humanity, and which are not solving its ghastly present-day problems. We should concentrate on the cause, because it is what is needed to cure the world. This is a sound attitude, for if we don't devote ourselves to the Baha'i work and teaching, who will. On the other hand, there is a big difference between this and learning. If the Baha'is want to be really effective in teaching the cause, they need to be much better informed and able to discuss intelligently, intellectually, the present condition of the world and its problems. We need Baha'i scholars, not only people far, far more deeply aware of what our teachings really are, but also well-read and well-educated people, capable of correlating our teachings to the current thoughts of the leaders of society. We Baha'is should, in other words, arm our minds with knowledge in order to better demonstrate to especially the educated classes the truths enshrined in our faith. What the Guardian, however, does not advise the Friends to do is to dissipate their time and energies in serving movements that are akin to our principles, but not, we believe, capable of solving the present spiritual crisis the world finds itself in. We can cooperate with such movements and their promoters to good effect, while at the same time openly standing forth as Baha'is with a specific program to offer society.
very heavy. What do I understand to be the essence of this quote? That the Baha'i writings, the writings of Baha'u'llah, the Bab, of Abdu'l Baha, and Shoghi Effendi, and the guidance of the Universal House of Justice is that the supreme elected body of the Baha'i Faith present to us a blueprint for the healing of the world. And that while we might be pulled to and fro to serve many other causes that might be akin to the goals of the Baha'i Faith, that really if we ourselves do not rise, study this faith, correlate it with the thoughts and questions, even objections of people, as we've looked at, who else is going to do this? And if it is actually the solution to the ghastly problems that humanity is facing, it is of urgent need that we just get down to it and actually study. So we hear again from the Guardian. The cause needs more Baha'i scholars, people who are not only devoted to it and believe in it, and are anxious to tell others about it, but also who have a deep grasp of the teachings and their significance, and who can correlate its beliefs with the current thoughts and problems of the peoples of the world. The cause has the remedy for all the world's ills. The reason why more people don't accept it is because the Baha'is are not always capable of presenting it to them in a way that meets the immediate needs of their minds. Young Baha'is like yourself must prepare themselves to really bring the message to their generation who need it so desperately, and who can understand the language it speaks so well. He would advise you, among other books, to study the talks of Abdu'l-Bahá, as his method of approaching the mind of the public cannot be surpassed. He also advises you to develop yourself as a public speaker, as you will be increasingly able to teach the cause. We're told here, in addition to that we need to study more deeply the cause, that we have to learn to be able to speak to people and address the immediate needs of their minds. Oftentimes we can get into a place where we're so excited about one facet of the Baha'i Faith, its social teachings, its philosophy, its theology, its relationship to different religions, that instead of actually teaching to the person that we're talking to, to address the questions they have, and to speak in a language that they can understand and feel familiar with, we actually just share our own thoughts we have to learn to be able to truly relate them to the person that's standing in front of us. And once again, the more we actually study the teachings, the more facets of the faith we actually begin to see, and then be able to bring to that person the facet of Baha'u'llah's revelation that best speaks to them. So this quote is from Shoghi Effendi, the Guardian. In their efforts to achieve this purpose, they must study for themselves, conscientiously and painstakingly, the literature of their faith, delve into its teachings, assimilate its laws and principles, ponder its admonitions, tenets, and purposes, commit to memory certain of its exhortations and prayers, master the essentials of its administration, and keep abreast of its current affairs and latest developments. They must strive to obtain from sources that are authoritative and unbiased a sound knowledge of the history and tenets of Islam the source and background of their faith, and approach reverently and with a mind purged from preconceived ideas, the study of the Qur'an. He then says, I strongly urge you to devote, while you are pursuing your studies, as much time as you possibly can to a thorough study of the history and teachings of our beloved cause. This is the prerequisite of a future successful career of service to the Baha'i Faith, in which I hope and pray you will distinguish yourself in the days to come. So again, we're seeing that we should be devoting as much time as we can to the study of the faith. Now, of course, everybody has the challenges of service, family, work, and we're being summoned to actually study the writings so that we can, once again, Remove much of what is our own perspective to truly understand what the faith is teaching and then to share that with people, to be able to correlate it to the problems and questions of humanity and to the individual in front of us. 
The Guardian also says, Another essential thing is that those who do embrace the faith should be constantly urged to study the literature of the cause. It is not sufficient that our numbers should increase. We want people whose faith stands on a rock and no trial can move. We want people who in turn arise and carry the message to other people and guide other souls. The following quote is from the Universal Halls of Justice. The objection most commonly raised against the foregoing conception of religion is the assertion that the differences among the revealed faiths are so fundamental that to present them as stages or aspects of one unified system of truth does violence to the facts. Given the confusion surrounding the nature of religion, the reaction is understandable. Chiefly, however, such an objection offers Baha'is an invitation to set the principles reviewed here more explicitly in the evolutionary context provided in Baha'u'llah's writings. So in this document, the Universal House of Justice is talking about the fundamental concept of the Baha'i Faith of progressive revelation, and how many of these different faiths uh, in the Baha'i view come from actually one source. They're all of God. And it's saying here that the most common objection that Baha'is can encounter is that the differences between the different world religions are just so fundamental that uh, saying that there are aspects of one unified system or different expressions of the same divine underlying reality uh, appears to do violence to the facts. Um, I love this quote because on the one hand it says this, um, this reaction is understandable. So uh, we shouldn't be shocked that this would be the prevailing view. But in addition, that um, the objection uh, against the concept of the unity of religion and progressive revelation should be seen as an invitation to us to actually set the principles and the concepts within these different faiths and their relationship together in their evolutionary context. But this can only actually be carried out uh, if we're coming increasingly to know uh, what these really what these faiths really say, and the differences that are actually amongst these different faiths um, themselves are not necessarily just the social teachings. On the surface, uh, many will tell you that, for example, Buddhism teaches uh, a conception of the reality where there is no god, or Hinduism is polytheistic, meaning it has actually many gods. Um, so within the realm of theology, the way that say Christianity sees God, or Judaism sees God, or Islam, or Buddhism, or Hinduism. Um, actually appears to do violence to the facts when you say they're one actual expression. Uh, and in addition, say the nature of the, of the founders of these faiths. Is the claim of Buddha really the same as Jesus Christ? Is the claim of the Prophet Muhammad the same as Krishna? Um, and in order to understand this, we can actually only do so through an actual investigation of the original texts themselves. And uh, the concept of well, their social teachings difference, being different, and how they're related to the time in which they were communicated, um, is not actually addressing the, the issue of, say, what is salvation, or what is the purpose of existence. Um, so, once again, we actually have to go back to the original uh, scriptures themselves to find that out. Uh, this next quote is from Abdul Bahan, The Secret of Divine Civilization. If, for example, a spiritually learned Muslim is conducting a debate with a Christian, and he knows nothing of the glorious melodies of the Gospel, he will, no matter how much he imparts of the Qur'an and its truths, be unable to convince the Christian, and his words will fall on deaf ears. Should, however, the Christian observe that the Muslim is better versed in the fundamentals of Christianity than the Christian priests themselves, and understands the purport of the scriptures even better than they, he will gladly accept the Muslim's arguments and he would indeed have no other recourse. So, in the context of this with this work, uh, Abdul Baha is telling uh, the Mus saying the Muslim actually has to have an understanding of the previous revelation of God, that of that of Jesus Christ, in order to actually be able to communicate with a person of that faith, or else what they say will fall on deaf ears. And uh, it's something really important to note that when we're actually communicating to say someone from the Buddhist faith. That oftentimes our our lack of knowledge of that community sacred scriptures and the beliefs contained therein can actually be the single most largest obstacle between ourselves and them. 
Yet if we actually say, for example, understand the terminology and the concepts within Buddhism, and we familiarize ourselves um, with our scriptures, then all of a sudden we can more deeply understand Buddhism on its own terms, and then see its relationships to the Baha'i Faith, and see how we can bridge that chasm of belief. Another thing I would add, actually, is that as we begin to familiarize ourselves say, with the writings of the Buddha, or the, or the New Testament of the story of Jesus Christ, we begin to be able to actually really connect with the uh, light in that lamp. So that we will really begin to be able to connect with the beauty of the manifestation of God in his expression to that community, in that evolutionary context. And this, uh, far from being merely like an intellectual exercise, we actually begin to truly be able to relate to people, because we can see the, the light and the bounty and the beauty in, for example, the life of the Buddha and his teachings. So when we're speaking with a Buddhist, we can then bridge not only the belief structures, but our communities as well. I have been informed the purpose of your class meeting is to study the significances and mysteries of the Holy Scriptures, and understand the meaning of the Divine Testaments. It is a cause of great happiness to me that you are turning into the Kingdom of God, that you desire to approach the presence of God, and to become informed of the realities and precepts of God. It is my hope that you may put forth your most earnest endeavour to accomplish this end, that you may investigate and study the Holy Scriptures word by word, so that you may attain knowledge of the mysteries hidden therein. Be not satisfied with words, but seek to understand the spiritual meanings hidden in the hearts of words." So Abdu'l-Baha is commending these people for studying the Holy Testaments, the Old Testament and the New Testament, these different scriptures. And he it's his hope that we put earnest endeavour into unlocking the mysteries of them, um, and going beyond like a, like a surface knowledge uh, of the Holy Scriptures, so we can actually see what is actually in the heart of the words, what is the import of them. That we can become more and more familiar, and I would suggest as well, with the, with the fragrance of that dispensation, to unlock uh, this Scripture so that once again we can actually build bridges between these communities, and see the beauty of the manifestation of God in this context. What is really important about this, truly, is if you wish to reach a Christian, let them see your love for Jesus. If you wish to really connect with a Buddhist, let them see and experience your love for the Buddha. And this could only occur from having a familiarity with the life of the Buddha, with the beauty of his revelation, or the life of Moses. The life of Jesus. So if you wish to actually truly achieve that, we're going to actually have to develop the relationship with that manifestation of God. All the texts and teachings of the Holy Testaments have intrinsic spiritual meanings. They are not to be taken literally. I therefore pray in your behalf that you may be given the power of understanding these inner real meanings of the Holy Scriptures, and may become informed of the mysteries deposited in the words of the Bible so that you may attain eternal life, and that your hearts may be attracted to the Kingdom of God. May your souls be illumined by the light of the words of God, and may you become repositories of the mysteries of God. For no comfort is greater and no happiness sweeter than spiritual comprehension of the divine teachings. And in another place he says, Divine things are too deep to be expressed by common words. The heavenly teachings are expressed in parable, in order to be understood and preserved for ages to come. When the spiritually minded dive deeply into the ocean of their meaning, they bring to the surface the pearls of their inner significance. There is no greater pleasure than to study God's word with a spiritual mind. I love these two quotes, <laughs> um, primarily because of what it's saying about the process of studying the Word of God. 
that there is no comfort greater or no happiness sweeter uh, than spiritual comprehension of the divine teachings. And at the same time, in the context of studying the holy texts, what we have here Abdu Baha asking us to unravel the inner meanings of the holy scriptures, and he mentions the Bible as an example here, and that. Uh, behind the, if you will, the surface of the words, there are any inner meanings and spiritual significances that are hidden behind, and it's the process of actually unlocking these inner significances and spiritual meanings that we're able to actually taste the sweetness of this. That at times we can in in interact with scriptures, especially if we're not familiar with them at first. I know myself when I first started studying Buddhist scripture because. It seemed slightly more foreign, that it took some time for me to understand the rhythms and the patterns and the way um, the Buddha spoke and the phrases he used, till it actually began to be unlocked. It's almost I, I think of it almost as like when you're learning to play like a musical instrument. At first, there's the process of slowly, you know, accumulating the skills, and then the beauty and sweetness of it actually starts to come through, and you really truly feel. Uh, the experience of the melodies inside yourself, and for me, this is what Abdul Baha is talking to about. Talking about, and what we ourselves. It's not that, for example, it's the duty of Christians to unlock the inner mysteries of the Bible, but it is our duty to do so with the Quran and the holy scriptures of these different world religions. Again, so we can. Relate what we know of previous dispensations, previous religions, to the gems that are enshrined within the Baha'i writings, and we can connect these. And by doing this again, as it was talking about a spiritually learned Muslim, we know the melodies, say, of the Gospel, or we know the melodies of the Bhagavad Gita, or we know the melodies of the Quran, and then we can actually become in concert with the believer of another dispensation of God's love to humankind. We can actually make them reverberate off each other, and in this way we can address the needs of the individual we're speaking to, and at the same time have this, the, the, the sweetness and joy of actually experiencing God's revelation to humankind from that, from that region. And it, it says there's no greater pleasure than to study God's Word with a spiritual mind. Not when we're actually looking at it in the sense of just trying to collect data, but when we're, when we're truly taking the, these previous holy books and actually trying to soak in the aroma and the fragrance of those revelations, we actually gain the joy of this, and at the same time we're able to reach out and connect the Baha'i teachings with these previous dispensations. Yeah, and by the process of actually reaching out and and being able to be in concert with them, we begin to see that uh, all the different holy scriptures are, in a sense, scenes of one like great tapestry. There's one profoundly beautiful puzzle <laughs> that can be brought together, and we begin to see them as different, if you will, different scenes within one greater story. Um, and then we can relate that greater story to the people we're talking to, so that instead of actually people seeing their beloved manifestation, their beloved prophet, as being uh, reduced in importance, rather they see that the fragrances of his love, say the love of Christ and the spirit of Christ, has actually been expressed elsewhere. It's not a diminution, diminution of of that messenger, but rather it's actually an, an expansion of his influence. This is from one common faith, which is a, a work commissioned by the World by World Center, the Universal of Justice. It says, the scriptures have not changed. The moral principles they contain have lost none of their validity. No one who sincerely poses questions to heaven, if he persists, will fail to detect an answering voice in the Psalms or in the Upanishads. Anyone with some intimation of the reality that transcends this material one will be touched to the heart by the words in which Jesus or Buddha speaks so intimately of it. I love this quote when I first encountered it, because of the different uh, conjoining of different dispensations that were actually brought together in this one quote. One, it's stating that the, the moral principles 
uh, themselves enshrined within actually these, these these revelations have not changed, and, and in addition, uh, no one who sincerely poses questions to heaven can fail to hear an answer. And then what is mentioned is the Upanishads and the Psalms. The Upanishads being um, a, a central text in in Hinduism, uh, an exquisite, beloved work, <laughs> actually. And at the same time, it then mentions Jesus and Buddha. In this one quote, it's so beautiful because it's mentioning the Psalms, Judaism, uh, Upanishads, a central text of Hinduism, Jesus, the New Testament, and the Buddha. And it's telling uh, the Baha'is themselves that actually they can hear the voice of the Divine actually pouring forth uh, from these previous dispensations. And it, it gives an invitation to actually explore them, just as Abdu Bob just said that we should be unlocking the mysteries within the Bible. There are delectable fruits and, and exquisite concepts enshrined within these works, and it is again our job to see that greater uh, that greater tapestry. Uh, this is actually from Shoghi Effendi, the Guardian. Uh, the Guardian would certainly advise and even urge the friends to make a thorough study of the Quran as the knowledge of this sacred scripture is absolutely indispensable for every believer who wishes to adequately understand and intelligently read the writings of Baha'u'llah. It's a very powerful quote, um, because I think that in our hearts, uh, every one of us wishes to adequately understand and intelligently read uh, the writings of Baha'u'llah. And we're told here that it's actually in, indispensable, not just indispensable, but absolutely indispensable. That in order for us to really understand what is happening in the revelation of Baha'u'llah, we actually must make a, a thorough study of the Qur'an itself. Uh, personally, I would actually extend this. My own studies of, of Buddhist scripture and Hindu scripture has enabled me to be able to see things in the, in the Baha'i writings, the writings of the Bab and Baha'u'llah and Abdu'l Baha, that I don't believe I ever would have seen if it hadn't been for having been schooled within the Buddhist scriptures. I see facets that suddenly that a Buddhist would actually just find breathtaking and a way again to have a bridge between these faiths. That it's actually by the process of studying the Upanishads or by the process of studying the Psalms they actually give us a greater context. Even in this quote, it's actually talking about uh, having an understanding of the Qur'an being absolutely indispensable, but the Qur'an itself is actually uh, fully imbued with the stories of Abraham, of Moses, of Lot, of Jesus. And in, in order to see the Qur'an in its context, we have to see it as actually answering the questions and the challenges posed um, from the Christian scriptures and Christian history subsequent to Jesus Christ. This is uh, Shoghi Effendi from God Passes By. To these defamations, threats, and protestations, the learned and resolute champions of a misrepresented faith, following the example of their leader, opposed unhesitatingly treatises, commentaries, and refutations, assiduously written, cogent in their argument, replete with testimonies, lucid, eloquent, and convincing, affirming their belief in the prophethood of Muhammad, in the legitimacy of the Imams, in the spiritual sovereignty of the Sahibu Zaman, the Lord of the Age, interpreting in a masterly fashion the obscure, the designedly allegorical and abstruse traditions, verses and prophecies in the Islamic Holy Writ, and adducing in support of their contention the meekness and apparent helplessness of the Imam Hussein, who, despite his defeat, his discomfiture, and ignominious martyrdom, had been hailed by their antagonists as the very embodiment of the matchless symbol of God's all-conquering sovereignty and power." This quote from Shoghi Effendi is just riddled with important concepts, and I guarantee it could be studied and explored in great, great depth. And what I see in this quote um, is that to the defamations, threats, and protestations of the learned, the Islamic community, <clears throat> the followers actually 
made commentaries and treatises and papers written in response to these concerns. And of course, they're affirming their belief in the Prophet, and the Imams, and the, the coming Promised One. But when they're doing so, they're interpreting in a masterly fashion the previous revelation. They're actually interpreting the allegorical and abstruse traditions, verses, and prophecies of the Islamic Holy Writ. So they're actually communicating what the Bab has come for, what Baha'u'llah had come for, through the Quran to, to the Islamic community. And they actually then use, in this context, the, the, the sovereignty, in order to explain the sovereignty of the Bab, in spite of him being executed. They use the story and the principle of the Imam Hussein to communicate how the Bab actually could have this sovereignty and this dominion in spite of his, of his execution by showing that this is exactly what the Islamic community sees within the martyrdom of the Imam Hussein. This, this entire quote, uh, in my understanding, is actually trying to communicate how the, the, the Babis and the Baha'is were actually utilizing the previous dispensation and their understanding and study of it to actually communicate to uh, the Islamic community what they may not have been able to hear. And this is again only possible by studying the Islamic Holy Writ, or for example studying the Hindu Holy Writ, or the Buddhist Holy Writ, or the Christian Holy Writ. So this, this idea of actually studying the text itself, uh, this is only a, a small, small selection of actually writings of the Baha'i Faith uh, regarding the duty of study and also regarding the exquisite beauty and, and sacredness of these previous dispensations and their scriptures. This is uh, written on behalf of Shoghi Effendi. First is the importance of the study of Islam, which subject is still new to the majority of the believers, but whose importance for a proper and sound understanding of the cause is absolutely indispensable. Your committee should therefore continue to emphasize the study of this all-important subject and make every effort to provide the attendance with all the facilities required such as textbooks, competent lecturers and writers, who though not necessarily Baha'is, should have a correct knowledge and sound appreciation of Islam, so as to be able to impress its true significance and mission upon all the attendants at the school." Of course, in this quote we have actually the study of Islam being brought up once again, and the, the phrase is being used again which is absolutely <laughs> indispensable. So it's absolutely indispensable for our own understanding of the Baha'i writings. Um, what I find fascinating about this is, of course, again, the, the Guardian saying to, pre, to provide these people who are trying to understand Islam with all the resources that they could need, even to the point of actually bringing in non-Baha'is and uh, to lecture actually upon this faith, to be able to, as best they can, expound the, the, the import and beauty of this, this, this previous dispensation. Once again, Shoghi Effendi. The revelation of which Baha'u'llah is the source and center abrogates none of the religions that have preceded it, nor does it attempt in the slightest degree to distort their features or to belittle their value. It disclaims any intention of dwarfing any of the prophets of the past, or of whittling down the eternal verity of their teachings. It can in no wise conflict with the spirit that animates their claims nor does it seek to undermine the basis of any man's allegiance to their cause. It's declared its primary purpose is to enable every adherent of these faiths to obtain a fuller understanding of the religion with which he stands identified, and to acquire a clear apprehension of its purpose. When it comes to the, the, the study of previous religions, uh, this is one of my favorite quotes. One, because it's putting before the Baha'i community what it is that we're supposed to be actually demonstrating, but, and at the same time giving an understanding of how we should empathize with how the Baha'i Faith is seen to people of, of previous communities. Because with people, say of the Christian, Islamic, or Buddhist, or Hindu, or Jewish, or Zoroastrian uh, communities, they would 
they see in the faith of Baha'u'llah a claim that it is abrogating, that it distorts the features of their religion. Many will feel that it is belittling their value, that it is whittling down the eternal verity of their teachings. Uh, that they necessarily see this because that's why they're not Baha'is, even when they encounter the faith. So how is it that we can show them that it does not conflict in any way with their aims, nor belittle their founders? That, that itself is actually answered, uh, is declared its primary purpose is to enable these adherents to obtain a fuller understanding of their religion, and a clearer apprehension of its purpose. Well, how is it that we can actually achieve that um, without understanding the, the faith we're talking about? So our job, uh, it's declared its primary purpose is to enable every adherent of these faiths to obtain a fuller understanding of the religion with which he stands identified, and to acquire a clearer apprehension of its purpose. We're to take something like the, the, the message and the revelation of the blessed Jesus, and be able to communicate to the people that this is in no way taking away the allegiance of the Christian to Jesus Christ, but rather seeing that same light in a new lamp. Uh, this, is, this is very, we see this actually within the New Testament, because when Jesus Christ was coming and preaching with, uh, within Israel Palestine, he was preaching and people would come up and ask questions. And then, and then many of the Jewish doctors and Jewish leaders were against Christ. At one point, um, the Jewish divines uh, are asking some questions about Jesus, and his followers say, uh, well, it's actually a man he healed, says, well, so do you wish to be his disciple too? And they get upset. <laughs> they respond, well, no, we are the disciples of Moses. And this event uh, shows exactly, in essence, what often the concern, say, of a Muslim is, or of a Buddhist is, or a Hindu, or a Christian. It's, it's a perspective that they would be betraying a love. They would, be, they would be violating a covenant between themselves and their beloved. And we have to understand this. And it's through actually understanding the Qur'an, uh, through understanding these faiths, and being able to communicate to these faiths in their own language, through their own scripture, the profundity and beauty of actually the Baha'i faith but also the prof a deeper profundity and a deeper beauty of the faith which, which, with which they stand identified. And how could we possibly do this if we didn't know it? Even the language I'm using <laughs> can obscure uh, what the Baha'i faith actually really says about these divine dispensations of God's will unto humankind. Uh, when I use the terms previous religion or previous dispensation, that's only to mean historically like the repeated rising of the sun. Uh, because for me, when I'm actually looking at the scriptures of Buddhism, of, of Christianity, of Islam, of Judaism, I'm not looking at someone else's scripture. We're told that they're the word of God. We're, we're told to study them. And to me, um, they are merely really expressions of the same divine plan. We're told that this is the changeless face of God, eternal in the past and eternal in the future. And I know for me, I've often thought of it as if, you know, someone came up to me and actually had like a, a, a series of letters. And then I find out that these letters were actually from the father I never knew. And there was eight of them. <laughs> and then he were to lay them down what I only pick up the last letter that was written, and then read it to see what my parent had actually said to me and the counsel he had given, and his expression of love to me. No, I would pour through all of them. I would open each one and I would go over every single line and try to understand the, the development and expression of the mind of my mother or father and how they had attempted to communicate to me. And in some sense, I wouldn't be able to fully understand the last letter if I hadn't understood the first, and the process in between them. So in my own life, and in my own study of the Baha'i Faith, when I say I study the Baha'i Faith, I, I, I study the writings of the Buddha, or read the Upanishads, <laughs> or read the Bhagavad Gita, or the New Testament, because that, that is the Baha'i Faith. 
That is what it is to me. Now, I even remember when I was actually investigating the Baha'i Faith, because again, I said I wasn't uh, born a Baha'i, I asked uh, one of my Baha'i teachers, uh, who, like, what is the scripture of the Baha'i Faith? You know, I'm, I'm wondering, like, what's your Quran? What's your Bible? Um, and he walked out of the room, he said, you know, just wait a minute, walked out of the room, and then he came back, and he had just this stack of books, and he sat down and kind of put them out, and then started placing them in a row. And he said, well, this is our scripture. And as he laid them out, he laid out the Gothas of Zoroaster, and he laid out the Hebrew scriptures. It was even bound separately, it wasn't the New and Old Testament of Christianity. And then he laid out the New Testament, and the Quran, and the Buddhist scriptures, and writings of the Bab, and Baha'u'llah. And it just ended up being this, you know, like, just beautiful expression of actually seeing what it was that he meant by the unity of religion. Because it was just this, this spread, almost like a, you know what I mean? Like, almost like a rainbow of colors. And I remember thinking, like, you know, this is all yours. And this seems strange to many people, um, but often we don't recall that ourselves, uh, you know, the, when we talk about the Bible, it is actually a series of books, a series of different authors over thousands of years that are actually collected together, and it was slowly growing. And obviously, when the when the Christian community attached the New Testament and bound it in a single book, this seems very natural to the to the Christian, not to the Jew, right? And to me, it's almost as if, well, you, you and within the according to the Baha'i Faith, you could put the Quran and bind it, and you could put the Buddhist scriptures and bind it, and in the end, you'd have a book about this <laughs> this thing. So, um, this is what I really this section is trying to communicate. Just just that we have these love letters. There's and in this love letters, they paint this exquisite historical picture. Um, of all these expressions of love to humankind all throughout the ages. Seeing this, it, it, it's actually through using, again, the supreme gift of God to humankind. Uh, doing our own independent investigation of truth, uh, being summoned to study, <laughs> uh, to study the Baha'i writings, but also to study the holy texts and the previous love letters from God unto humankind, that we begin to see this exquisite uh, tapestry, be able to see how all the scenes actually connect to each other, and really hear the voice of the Beloved from previous ages. But also by studying them, in my own experience, I get to see nuances of what Baha'u'llah said, where he has sung a song to the Hindu community, where he is singing out a carol to the, to, to the Buddhist community, that we begin to see a really a symphony. And it's through this that for myself, uh, uh, there is no greater joy. Uh, there really isn't. So, so far we've looked at the uh, supreme gift of God to humankind, the path of knowledge, independent investigation of truth, uh, being summoned to study our own writings, but also to study the sacred scriptures of the various expressions of God's love to humankind throughout history. Uh, this is about studying the administration in particular, the Baha'i world order, uh, to see what it is that Baha'u'llah has brought to humankind to organize its political affairs, its social structure. Um, so we're going to start here with a quote from Shoghi Effendi. The best way for a Baha'i to serve his country and the world is to work for the establishment of Baha'u'llah's world order, which will gradually unite all men and do away with divisive political systems and religious creeds. This quote expresses in the, in the briefest way what I understand to be the real summon of Baha'u'llah to those of his servants, the Baha'is. That to understand that the best way we can serve our own lives, our family, but also our country and the world, is to work for the building up of the administrative order and the spreading of the fragrances of his teachings. That this is the way 
we will do away with these divisive political and religious issues that are really inflicting the body of humankind everywhere. The Guardian also says, The condition of the world today is such that it is obvious no political solution to its problems is going to be found. We Baha'is must therefore concentrate on Baha'u'llah's world order, the true solution. So we see all around us at this point in time the trials and tribulations of humanity. Um, almost none are unaffected by it. And we can often be pulled <laughs> uh, to and fro to different causes or things that summon our attention. And it's really to remember that we actually believe that this is actually the true solution, the remedy for these problems, and that we actually have to concentrate on Baha'u'llah's world order, as it says, the true solution to these issues. In, in doing this, um, we, the few who have caught the vision, should not waste our energies, beating up and down the paths pursued by humanity, and which are not solving its ghastly present-day problems. We should concentrate on the cause, because it is what is needed to cure the world. Without the study and application of the administration, the teachings of the cause become not only meaningless, but lose in effectiveness and in scope. This is from Shoghi Effendi in 1935. We see here that when we're talking about actually sharing Baha'u'llah's teachings with humankind, and, and sharing the solutions for humanity that he's actually brought, that the, that the Divine Physician has given us, that oftentimes I find we can, we can forget that one truly fundamental aspect of that cure, the vehicle that actually delivers the remedy to humankind, is actually the, the, the administration itself. That here he's saying it's not only meaningless, but loses in effectiveness. Because the Baha'i administration is the vehicle, the, the political order, the structure that will enable humankind to heal the political divisiveness. At the same time, it's not a uh, pragmatic, you know, you know, uh, just a pragmatic instrument. It is a integral but also sacred administration, a sacred part of what the divine remedy is to humankind. This is again Shoghi Effendi. A careful look at the subjects mentioned in your program clearly reveals the fact that the friends have at last come to realize how indispensable it is for them to deepen their knowledge of the background and of the administrative development of the cause. These were indeed the two main points which they had hitherto neglected to study, and the time has come when they have to attach to them all the importance they deserve. Particularly remarkable has been your effort in regard to the study of the administration, an important new feature in the history of the cause, the study of which is becoming increasingly indispensable to every thoughtful student of the faith. It is hoped that in the next few years all our Baha'i summer schools, whether in the States or abroad, will make a conscious and thorough attempt to fully acquaint the friends with the origin, nature, and peculiar significance of the nascent administrative institutions of the cause, which constitute a humble, though a very exact pattern of the world order of Baha'u'llah. It is of the utmost importance that from now the believer should get familiar with the rudiments of the administration, that they may not follow the path which the followers of older religions have trodden, and which have led to their eventual downfall. Here the Arnie is telling us that in order to understand what actually Baha'u'llah has brought, even though it may be in a seed-like form, especially in 1933, when this is being read, that we can actually see in this seed the exact pattern of the tree that's actually going to come out of it. And that it's indispensable for us to get an understanding of the origin, nature, and peculiar significance of the Baha'i administration. Especially in this day when we actually have it much more flowered. It actually truly is a sapling. And we can see, especially now, the way it will actually solve the political divisiveness of our world. How much it is actually the remedy that Baha'u'llah has brought 
for the unification of humankind and the protection of all peoples. The quote reads, It seems that what we need now is a more profound and coordinated Baha'i scholarship in order to attract such men as you are contacting. The world has, at least the thinking world, caught up by now with all the great and universal principles enunciated by Baha'u'llah over 70 years ago, and so of course it does not sound new to them. But we know that the deeper teachings, the capacity of his projected world order to recreate society, are new and dynamic. It is these we must learn to present intelligently and enticingly to such men. This quote from the Guardian points out that for many people, uh, certain principles of the Baha'i Faith they would immediately get an, uh, an affirmation. Of course, of course, you know, the equality of men and women, the equality of the races. <laughs> um, and this will increasingly happen. So, and he's telling us that it's actually the deeper teachings of the faith, but also the administrative order, the capacity of this projected world order to recreate society. That once again, many people might choose you know, this principle of the Baha'i Faith, or that principle of the Baha'i Faith that they find actually beautiful and can agree with. But it, it is actually the world order itself, the administrative order, that if we show to them intelligently and enticingly, that it can actually bring out the deep and profound admiration of all peoples. And we can possibly do this uh, unless we actually do a thorough and deep study of the administrative order, including all the social teachings and the more deeper philosophical, mystical, and spiritual teachings of the Baha'i Faith, because they all come as this one, uh, one remedy for humankind. And I found myself constantly in my, in my own teaching efforts, because we'll go through like many of the principles of the Baha'i Faith and how exquisite they are, but oftentimes when I you know, show up at firesides or get into dialogue with people who have actually been around the Baha'i Faith for quite some time, um, they'll know that the Baha'is do like you know, social activism and they help in neighborhoods and stuff like this, right? But often, and I mean very often in my own personal experience, um, they actually don't know anything about the administrative order. Uh, they don't know anything about how the process of Baha'i elections actually protects humanity from corruption, how it actually is the vehicle that can guide us to that golden age, uh, the most great peace per, uh, predicted and prophesied by Baha'u'llah. And I, I always feel a little bit sad, because <laughs> sometimes it's people who have been around the faith for years that have no idea of its administrative order. And here Shoghi Effendi is telling us that it is, this is what we need to be teaching, because it's how it will recreate society, and it's new and dynamic. And be able to show that to people will finally give them a, a, a vision as to how they can transform society. And we just saw that this is the true solution, the only way we're going to actually be able to solve this. Um, so we really need deep, uh, as he said, coordinated by scholarship. So many people come together to have a deeper and deeper understanding of the political order of Baha'u'llah. This is from the Universal House of Justice. Uh, which is the supreme elected body of the Baha'i Faith uh, within the Baha'i Administration. It is evident then that, as a Baha'i who is a political scientist, you have a great deal of latitude to comment on social issues. It is also possible to participate in the generation and application of knowledge in your field by dealing with topics that are more directly political in nature. You are no doubt aware of the general advice written on behalf of the Guardian, that one way to criticize the social and political order of the day without siding with or opposing an existing regime is to offer a deeper analysis on the level of political theory rather than practical politics. We see here that the Universal House of Justice is explaining to the Baha'i community the way they can be political with their fellow men. I am, I am regularly asked about politics, um, and whenever I do, I actually immediately move in to what I believe the political order should be like. And that very nature is, is a critique and a deeper analysis on the level of political theory, 
that oftentimes I think Baha'is can be seen as if we're uh, bystanders because we're not involved in the, in the political you know, factions of, of today. We're actually seen as if we're standing aloof. Um, and and we're, we've been given a way to actually address political issues, to share uh, with humanity a new way to look at politics that can actually solve the problems that so upset the average person. And that can only happen if we actually have a deeper understanding. And that deeper understanding needs to be developed by a more coordinated scholarship into the Baha'i administration as individuals who, who catch the, you know, the fragrance of, Baha of the love of Baha'u'llah and actually find the administration itself as a really a facet uh, that they wish to actually delve into, then we begin to collect a deeper and deeper understanding of the administration. Because in my own study uh, over the years of the Baha'i administration, it truly actually is the solution to so many of the everyday complaints that people have about politics. But they don't know. And they have a right to hear it. He says, The Baha'i Commonwealth of the future, of which this vast administrative order is the sole framework, is both in theory and practice not only unique in the entire history of political institutions, but can find no parallel in the annals of any of the world's recognized religious systems. No form of democratic government, no system of autocracy or of dictatorship, whether monarchical or republican, no intermediary scheme of a purely aristocratic order, nor even any of the recognized types of theocracy, whether it be the Hebrew commonwealth or the various Christian ecclesiastical organizations, or the imamate or the caliphate in Islam. None of these can be identified or be said to conform with the administrative order which the master hand of its perfect architect has fashioned. We're being told here by the Guardian that the Baha'i administrative order, the world order of Baha'u'llah, its framework and structure, its theory, in no way conforms to any of the previous institutions, the previous political structures or ecclesiastical organizations. And it gives us a way to actually really truly look into the comparative nature of this political system and be able to expound this to people. Because oftentimes, um, when people meet the faith in any framework, they'll say, oh, you know, I know that. <laughs> because <laughs> what we do is, oftentimes we judge so quickly, instead of really truly listening, and really truly studying something, that we immediately slot what we've heard into something that we've previously understood. And it is the Baha'i's job, because again, as we've heard, who else will do it, um, to really show that the Baha'i Commonwealth of the future, of which the administrative order today is the framework, actually is none of these former forms of political organization. What else could these weighty words signify if they did not point to the inevitable curtailment of unfettered national sovereignty? as an indispensable preliminary to the formation of the future commonwealth of all the nations of the world. Some form of world superstate must needs be evolved, in whose favor all the nations of the world will have willingly ceded every claim to make war, certain rights to impose taxation, and all rights to maintain armaments except for purposes of maintaining internal order within their respective dominions. Such a state will have to include within its orbit an international executive, adequate to enforce supreme and unchallengeable authority on every recalcitrant member of the Commonwealth, a world parliament whose members shall be elected by the people in their respective countries, and whose election shall be confirmed by their respective governments and a supreme tribunal whose judgment will have a binding effect even in such cases where the parties concerned did not voluntarily agree to submit their case to its consideration. A world community in which all economic barriers will have been permanently demolished and the interdependence of capital and labor definitely recognized 
in which the clamor of religious fanaticism and strife will have been forever stilled, in which the flame of racial animosity will have been finally extinguished, in which a single code of international law, the product of the considered judgment of the world's federated representatives, shall have as its sanction the instant and coercive intervention of the combined forces of the federated units, and finally a world community in which the fury of a capricious and militant nationalism will have been transmuted into an abiding consciousness of world citizenship. Such indeed appears in its broadest outline, the order anticipated by Baha'u'llah, an order that shall come to be regarded as the fairest fruit of a slowly maturing age. This quote from Shoghi Effendi is emblematic of the profound vision actually put forward by Baha'u'llah. A system that touches on international economic order, political order, military order, on international law, international courts, a system that we as Baha'is have the duty to understand and present to the world. Um, we will be looking at this concept uh, in future discussions about what the world order Baha'u'llah really entails. But in this case, uh, it's usually a quote I use because I'll say, you know, is the Baha'i faith non-political? It is. It is a non-political organization that places ultimate authority in, in the, the respected governments of whatever country they live in. Even to the point of actually being willing to dismantle our own administration at the request of any government under which we abide. Uh, Baha'is have to be the ultimate uh, law-abiding citizen. At the same time, in a different sense of being political, not about whether you know siding with or against some political party or some political leader or being involved in partisan politics, in that way we truly are non-political. At the same time, uh, the way I often have put it is, is that there really is no more political faith in human history. We actually have a theory of regional and international economics. We actually have a theory about global security, about political order, about what, whether or not we should have a party system. We actually have fundamental ways of actually running elections that are completely different from the way anybody else on the planet is doing it or has ever done it before. We are asked to actually study the administrative order, to use the Baha'i writings to more deeply understand what it is that Baha'u'llah is sharing. We're talking here about a international executive, a world tribunal, the removal of trade barriers, um, the, the controlling of nationalism. Um, what what Shoghi Effendi says in other places is um, the acceptance of a sane patriotism, right? while at the same time the curtailment of unlimited or unfettered national sovereignty for the greater good. Uh, a system of world federated units. Again, here is not the place to actually go into deeply what the Baha'i administrative order in the future lesser piece, and most great pieces it's called in the Baha'i writings, will actually look like. But to say that part and parcel of what it means to be a Baha'i and be, with, be deepened as a Baha'i is to truly understand what is the vehicle that the Baha'u'llah has brought as the remedy from him, the Divine Physician, to, to solve the sickness of that it's afflicting humanity. By the coming dawn, in the title of this section, I mean the coming world order of Baha'u'llah. Um, what we were just looking at, the, the rise of the administration and the unification of the whole world, and how we should be serving this coming dawn. Our first quote here um, is from Shoghi Effendi. The more we see the crying need of the world for the spiritual teachings of our faith, the more restless we should feel in giving out the message and improving the means of diffusing the precepts of the cause. I know for myself 
because I, I keep informed quite a bit about the, the struggles and trials of humanity. Um, it can be very, <laughs> very, very difficult to see how much suffering there actually is. And the question is, is how do we respond to that suffering? Some people turn away and ignore it because it's so difficult to actually see. Other people become filled with rage, deep anger. And I know myself, I've felt anger at the suffering of humankind. But what is the response we should have? We should feel restless, this quote says. But restless to act, the action itself being to give the message and improve the means of actually sharing that message. So it means we should be wanting to give it and then find out better ways to actually share it with the world. Another quote from Abdu'l-Baha. As to the terminology I used in my letter, bidding thee to consecrate thyself to the service and the cause of God, the meaning of it is this, limit thy thoughts to teaching the faith. Act by day and night according to the teachings and counsels and admonitions of Baha'u'llah. This is such a striking phrase by Abdu'l-Baha. He says to limit our thoughts to teaching the faith. And I think if we move through some of the other quotes, we'll get a better understanding of why. The next quote, which is from Shoghi Effendi. You should rest assured that your painstaking efforts will in time bear fruit, and should not feel discouraged, therefore, if you have not so far succeeded in accomplishing any tangible results. Now is the time of seed sowing, and consequently one of slow and painful progress, but the harvest which the future shall reap will be incalculably rich, and great will also be a reward for having so unremittingly toiled in bringing it about. Some of the examples that always come uh, to my mind when I read quotes like this is actually the movement for democracy is one of them. I myself live in a, in a democratic country where people can elect their representatives. And I think oftentimes we actually forget how new such an experience is for humankind in the long human history. But there's another aspect of its development that we forget as well, which is that it was built by people. It was developed and promulgated by people. The right to do such a thing was actually one on the backs of people, but not just people who strive and struggled and did all they could to actually forward that cause, but who themselves actually didn't see the fruit of the very thing they were working for. Shoghi Effendi here is talking about not being discouraged when you don't see tangible results. Why? Because all great movements in human history actually had to have people who at the dawn or the beginning when that movement was in its seed-like form couldn't pluck the apples or fruits from that tree and eat of them. But they actually needed to tend it or else we would never be able to eat it. And we're trying to develop, as we just saw in the administrative order, a system which will actually cure the ills of humankind and really bring on a golden age of humanity, a united world. And until that occurs, the suffering of the patient will continue. So we are being asked in all of these sections uh, that we've been looking at to really delve to, both into the writings and into our own hearts so that we can muster the, the strength to actually do this. And Abdu'l-Baha telling us to limit our thoughts to teaching the faith, we have to understand how expansive that is, how much of a human expression that it can actually be. And in here to build up a system for which we will not harvest its fruits. Um, we think, I think often, for example, of the suffragette movement for women's equality. Um, a battle we are still trying to win, right? The people that fought, the women that fought for that, uh, did 
didn't actually get to see it. They themselves toiled for it, for the emancipation of slaves. The people that were fighting for the emancipation often never saw a world in which slavery was gone. But thank God they sacrificed that we could live in a world where it has been abolished. That's what we're being asked, and asked to not feel discouraged when things do not bear fruit in our time. And we have to realize that the, the source of the ills of humankind, the battle we're waging, is not one of money or resources. We have the money or the resources. We actually could solve the world's problems. What is holding us back is how we see the world, how we see ourselves, the nature of humankind. It is fundamentally a, a spiritual issue, a, a malady that is holding us back from becoming what we truly could be as individuals and also as, as a planet, as a species. There is so much suffering, such a great and desperate need for a true remedy, and the Baha'i should realize their sacred obligation is to deliver the message to their fellow men at once, and on as large a scale as possible. If they fail to do so, they are really partly responsible for prolonging the agony of humanity. This quote from Shoghi Effendi can be very emotionally challenging. <laughs> Um, we're being told we have a sacred obligation to take a remedy, a medicine, to cure humankind. We're being asked to actually take a remedy, a medicine, for the sickness of humankind and bring it to our fellow men as quickly as we can on as large a scale as possible. Because if we don't do that, we're prolonging their agony. And if, as a, as a Baha'i who believes in Baha'u'llah's solution for the world's problems, for his remedy, but how could I possibly deny this, no matter how emotionally uncomfortable that might be? Because it's as if we had some transformative technology that could actually solve the world's energy problems, or give clean water to everyone, or be able to feel like to solve the problems of starvation or malnutrition. And we're holding that technology, and we just have to bring it to the right people, and actually that technology would be implemented, but we sit back. So naturally, that's actually going to prolong their agony. If we have the remedy for the sickness of a person, and we know they need it, but we sit back, of course the sickness mm -hmm. continues. It is a very difficult thing to square ourselves with at times. But it's something we have to realize and really, really, really take to heart. One of the signs of a decadent society, a sign which is very evident in the world today, is an almost frenetic devotion to pleasure and diversion. An insatiable thirst for amusement, a fanatical devotion to games and sport, a reluctance to treat any matter seriously, and a scornful, derisory attitude towards virtue and solid worth. Abandonment of a frivolous conduct does not imply that a Baha'i must be sour-faced or perpetually solemn. Humor, happiness, joy are characteristics of a true Baha'i life. Frivolity palls and eventually leads to boredom and emptiness. But true happiness and joy and humor that are parts of a balanced life that includes serious thought, compassion, and humble servitude to God are characteristics that enrich life and adds to its radiance. This is an exquisite quote, because it's telling us that we are in an environment that is increasingly becoming more distracted, more interested in its own self-gratification, which leads to an apathy to treat anything seriously or to summon out of our hearts the compassion for humanity. At the same time, it's not asking us to be solemn or sour-faced. We're supposed to be joyful, to be happy, to have humor and delight in our life. Yet at the same time, 
includes serious thought and compassion and humble servitude, a willingness to go out and actually serve humanity. And we have to learn to be able to treat important topics with the seriousness they deserve. Because the healing of humankind depends upon it. We actually have a remedy. It doesn't mean we can't enjoy our lives and have delights. Yet at the same time, a balanced life is one that actually includes both. Instead of being having an insatiable thirst or a fanatical devotion to diversions. Um, and if we can actually achieve this balanced life, we can then move out and actually begin to actually heal the problems of our planet. I think that in the end, there is a redefinition of what fun means. And it's something we actually have to learn. We actually have to learn, even I believe, a different meaning of the word freedom. There's two different kinds of freedom. There's the, the freedom to do nothing, <laughs> but there's also the freedom to learn the violin. A freedom that you gain through sacrifice and training to express yourself through music. There's one freedom that might be, I don't know, watching movies nonstop or watching sport games endlessly, but there's another freedom, the freedom of an acrobat, someone who has trained themselves. Now by this I don't mean that we shouldn't have time to relax and enjoy life, but we must at the same time understand that oftentimes when we're relaxing, if not in balance, that we're actually leaving people in agony and prolonging the suffering of humankind. So how can we actually come to a place where we're actually serving this coming dawn of the Golden Age through using our minds, through serving humbly, through studying the holy text, understanding different faiths, and studying the administration to show to our fellow man a purposeful life, a life with integrity and high principles, which include joy and simple delights. When we look at relaxation and rest, which is actually important, we can see it, one, uh, as a tool for the recuperation, uh, the rest restoration, if you will, of our energy to, in order to go out and again serve humankind. Doesn't mean that we can't do it, but how is it taken? And as well, what do we do in it? <laughs> there are many different ways to relax. We can relax in beautiful conversations with friends. We can relax in the arts, right? We can actually relax even in study. I myself find it very, very peaceful to actually take up a sacred letter from the Beloved written long ago and inhale the fragrance, say, from the Gospel or from the Upanishads. And I believe that as, as we actually come to really nurture ourselves in this way, we get to find rest and solace in places we actually never would have thought. And yes, as I gave the example of learning a musical instrument, oftentimes Deeper and deeper solaces and deeper and deeper uh, experience of rest and peace comes after the sacrifice and training to achieve a goal of great worth. This next quote is from Baha'u'llah in the Book of Certitude. Meditate profoundly that the secrets of things unseen may be revealed unto you, that you may inhale the sweetness of a spiritual and imperishable fragrance that you may acknowledge the truth that from time immemorial, even unto eternity, the Almighty hath tried and will continue to try his servants, so that light may be distinguished from darkness, truth from falsehood, right from wrong, guidance from error, happiness from misery, and roses from thorns. Even as he hath revealed do men think when they say we believe, they shall be let alone and not be put to proof. This quote from Baha'u'llah is a theme that runs all throughout the Baha'i writings. And I hope, God willing, in the future we can actually look into it very deeply. We're being told that from time immemorial, even unto eternity, that God tests his servants. There are allurements of this world that can draw us away. There are aspects even within the dispensations that can often challenge us. But these things are being used to actually 
and to enable us to exercise ourselves, to surmount obstacles, to grow and develop. Um, we all know that the muscles of our body only actually develop under the strain of pressure. That our ability, for example, to learn a new skill or learn a new art, to learn the sciences, to learn a new language, actually only come as we struggle past obstacles, as if slowly climbing the ladder. But in this case, we're climbing the ladder of ascent of our own being. That we actually have a world, as we were just talking about with these allurements, right? That may call to us. That at times we have to realize that these themselves are the way that we can actually train. These are the weights we actually have to lift as we ascend towards being able to have a balanced, rich Baha'i life. One that includes joy and delight. Joys and delights of a higher nature, while at the same time being in humble service, study, and the promotion of a world order that's going to truly solve the problems of humankind. The unity of the human race as envisaged by Baha'u'llah, implies the establishment of a world commonwealth in which all nations, races, creeds, and classes are closely and permanently united, and in which the autonomy of its state members and the personal freedom and initiative of the individuals that compose them are definitely and completely safeguarded. This commonwealth must, as far as we can visualize it, consist of a world legislature whose members will, as the trustees of the whole of mankind, ultimately control the entire resources of all the component nations, and will enact such laws as shall be required to regulate the life, satisfy the needs, and adjust the relationships of all races and peoples. A world executive, backed by an international force, will carry out the decisions arrived at, and apply the laws enacted by this world legislature, and will safeguard the organic unity of the whole commonwealth. A world tribunal will adjudicate and deliver its compulsory and final verdict in all and any disputes that may arise between the various elements constituting this universal system. A mechanism of world intercommunication will be devised, embracing the whole planet freed from national hindrances and restrictions, and functioning with marvelous swiftness and perfect regularity. A world metropolis will act as the nerve center of a world civilization, the focus towards which the unifying forces of life will converge and from which its energizing influences will radiate. A world language will either be invented or chosen from among the existing languages and will be taught in the schools of all the federated nations as an auxiliary to their mother tongue. A world script, a world literature, a uniform and universal system of currency, of weights and measures, will simplify and facilitate intercourse and understanding among the nations and races of mankind. In such a world society, science and religion, the two most potent forces in human life, will be reconciled, will cooperate, and will harmoniously develop. The press. Under, the press will, under such a system, while giving full scope to the expression of the diversified views and convictions of mankind, cease to be mischievously manipulated by vested interests, whether private or public and will be liberated from the influence of contending governments and peoples. The economic resources of the world will be organized. Its sources of raw materials will be tapped and fully utilized. Its markets will be coordinated and developed, and the distribution of its products will be equitably regulated. National rivalries, hatreds, and intrigues will cease and racial animosity and prejudice will be replaced by racial amity, understanding, and cooperation. The causes of religious strife will be permanently removed. Economic barriers and restrictions will be completely abolished, and the inordinate distinction between classes will be obliterated. Destitution on the one hand and gross accumulation of ownership on the other will disappear. 
the enormous energy dissipated and wasted on war, whether economic or political, will be consecrated to such ends as will extend the range of human inventions and technical development, to the increase of the productivity of mankind, to the extermination of disease, to the extension of scientific research, to the raising of the standard of physical health, to the sharpening and the refinement of the human brain, to the exploitation of the unused and unsuspected resources of the planet, to the prolongation of human life, and to the furtherance of any other agency that can stimulate the intellectual, the moral, and spiritual life of the entire human race. A world federal system ruling the whole earth and exercising unchallengeable authority over its unimaginably vast resources, blending and embodying the ideals of both the East and the West, liberated from the curse of war and its miseries, and bent on the exploitation of all the available sources of energy on the surface of the planet. A system in which force has made the servant of justice, whose life is sustained by its universal recognition of one God, and by its allegiance to one common revelation. Such is the goal, such is the goal towards which humanity, impelled by the unifying forces of life, is moving. Some Shoghi Effendi, World Order of Baha'u'llah. It's almost impossible to express how glorious a vision this actually is. It's so shocking because each sentence of this quote from Shoghi Effendi itself would, could constitute an entire study. It itself is a charter for people of different disciplines, whether it be from the, remove, the removal of trade barriers or the establishment of an international Israeli language, to a supreme tribunal, to the relationship between science and religion. This really is a, is a several page list of the fundamental goals of the world order that we in this age are trying to actually establish. It is a breathtaking and astounding vision of humankind. And it is something that we can achieve, utopian as it might seem to some people. In order to achieve that, we actually have to realize that many of the fruits of this world can test us. Be willing to actually summon the resolve to actually use our minds, tread the path of knowledge, perform our own independent investigation of truth, to recognize the vision that Baha'u'llah has actually laid before us, and study it deeply correlated to the many problems of humankind, as they're listed here, study the philosophical systems of our world to be able to intelligently, comprehensively, with clear and conclusive arguments, demonstrate this to humanity. To move forward, to be able to actually study the holy texts of previous dispensations, previous expressions of God's love, whether it be in Islam or Buddhism, and see actually how these are actually brought together in this exquisite tapestry. Also to be able to understand the melodies and expressions of those previous lamps of the same light, so that we can actually share this message with humankind. To then study the world order itself, the ark upon which humankind will sail, the solution and remedy to the problems of our world. One could spend a lifetime actually just studying one of these topics. And people will. People will spend their entire life trying to work out and produce some of the economic, political, scientific, linguistic aspects of the vision that's been put forward here. And that's what we're asked to do. And even when we're doing it in our own academic investigations, we're to actually reach out to people who are actually serving principles akin, but when we do, to stand out as Baha'is, to actually put forward the Baha'i vision itself, both within the academic area, say, that we're in, be it linguistics, right, 
or agriculture and then show that it is a part, an organ of a larger body that is meant to carry humankind forward. And of course this can't be done without actually sacrifice. And as the quote previously said, unremitting toil at times. Recognizing that we actually won't see the fruit of the vision that actually we're reading here. But it needs someone, some groups of people to rise up. No matter what their shortcomings are, no matter what their capacity, and, and actually fight for this vision. To fight with their character, their tongues, their pens to share it with humankind so they can finally be given the message that they're actually hoping for. There's a quote not covered here where Abdu'l-Bahá in the selections of the writings of Abdu'l-Bahá says, in this order, in this economy of Baha'u'lláh, this divine order, is given the hopes and dreams of every community, be it religious, political, philosophical, moral, it is a bold and shocking claim, but it's a claim that we are here to demonstrate, to do our best over the generations to have coordinated scholarship, as it was said in the administrative order section, to have places of learned people studying comparative religion to actually bring this message to humankind. And it's for this reason that this presentation has been developed. Please remember that uh, in the description below, as I said at the beginning of this, uh, all the quotes that were actually used in this presentation uh, will be in a PDF file, as well as an audio version of this presentation. So if you wish to share it with others or review it yourself, um, please download it and you can listen to it on your audio. Uh, we've come to the end of the presentation. Again, I just wanted to uh, thank the Baha'i Administrative Order and all those that serve in it to thank anyone who has taken the time to watch this work and to please in whatever way or capacity you can, even if you feel tired or alone at times in the service that you are carrying out in whatever capacity to whatever degree, to keep going. Thank you very much.